Chevyscape, as I occasionally let slip Chevyscape. It's one of those difficult names to say, it's a different acronym to choose. But cultural heritage in landscape. Um, we have a web page. Is it linked? No, doesn't matter. We have a web page which is easily found if you want to look at it. Um, Okay. I'll start with a few words, a couple of slides about generalities, um, underlying philosophy is too strong a word probably, the underlying ideas that sit behind and underneath and which hold up Shadowscape, and then I'll move on to discussing what we aim to do and what, how the project is working. Um, I think w when we applied for this, the JPI was a, go a good um, target for this project because one of the things we're trying to do is look in new ways at at, at heritage and what heritage means and how it is carried out and looking new ways at landscape what, what landscape means and what it means to people and how it actually acts on people's lives and most of all at what happens when they come together and all of that comes out of maybe 10, 20, perhaps 30 years of slow change in attitudes towards both heritage and landscape which is still going on but nevertheless I think as it said at the top here I think the JPI is, has been created just at the moment of, of fairly large-scale change in the heritage world in terms of attitudes and, ob and um, aspirations, objectives, membership, the, the whole inclusivity debate, the public-private changes we've been, we've been hearing about and so on. And I think heritage is changing and landscape has also been changing and it's, it's a good time to bring these two together. You won't be able to read all that probably, it's not necessarily meant to be read. Um, but on both halves of the house, so to speak, landscape and heritage, new ideas have been emerging for some time. On the landscape side, they've been crystallised, distilled into the European Landscape Convention, a Council of Europe Convention, and on the heritage side, to some extent, fairly substantially, they've been enshrined in the Council of Europe's Convention on the value of cultural heritage for society, which is unlike any of the other heritage conventions that they've, they've produced in the past. It's more about what heritage is for, not how you protect it or which bits you protect. Values are in there, but values for a different reason. So, over the last 10, 20, 30 years, perhaps, I mean, we've, you've, you've all seen it, all, all been watching it happening, we've had, on both sides, landscape and heritage, have had widening definitions. On the landscape side, we're a, a million years away from landscape being the, the beautiful scenery or, or, an, or painting. It is those, but it's also where people live. It's urban as well as, as rural. It's ugly and degraded as well as um, comfortable and nice. It's conflicted. It's almost anything. It's where people live, in effect, rather than where they visit. It's not the tourist places alone. It's all the, the framework of their lives. And heritage in the same way. We've seen heritage widen out from being the great buildings and the great monuments, and mainly medieval and 18th century, to including industrial, to including post-industrial, to including military and World War II things, to including things like Holocaust commemoration sites, and so on and so on. Increasingly, ever-widening definitions on both sides. And with that goes greater ambitions. Because once you enlarge your definition of landscape to be everywhere and your definition of heritage to be almost everything, you can't protect it all in the old-fashioned way. You have to use different methods. I'm not saying you don't still protect the, the special places, but we've been neglecting all the rest for a century, and it's time to find ways to deal with all the rest. And on the heritage side, that involves ideas like different ways of transmission to do with recycling, reuse, adaptive reuse. Instead of saying that this building was once a church, <coughs> It's no longer a church, we need to keep it in some way because we want the architecture, we want the, its place in the urban fabric, whatever the reason, you need to find new uses for it. So it's a much, a much more flexible attitude towards how you pass things on. And that, that applies in the, in the lands, landscape world as well, because throughout most of Western and increasingly Eastern Europe, the um, agricultural methods, for example, that have made the landscape look like it is in the countryside, no longer exist. You don't have small farmers working together in, in collectivities with archaic machinery, or even with no machinery, you have industrialised agriculture working to the global market. So the, the landscape that's created by the traditional methods cannot be kept without either making farmers pretend to be museum keepers or by changing other things. So landscape has to, has to be, go through a process of adaptation too. Um, oh, we could take any of these and talk for hours really, but about halfway down, plural systems of value. We've seen in heritage a, a widening out of values from what, what was once the main value of a heritage site, its evidential value, what it meant to experts, historians, archaeologists, or architectural historians, to a whole range of values, including the social and the economic, including instrumental values, and it's exactly the same for landscape. So increasingly, landscape and heritage are looking similar in, in the way they work. And I can really hardly see the difference these days. 
So Chairscape fits into that, I think, fits into that positive change, and we just want to push it a bit further if we can. And we're not concerned with hedged landscapes, those bits of the landscape which might, people might think a hedge is cost particularly old or particularly well-deserved or so-called traditional. We're, concerned with, we're not concerned with landscape heritage, either the bits of the landscape which, which are old and people think is the historic component of landscape, because all the landscape is inherited, it's all historic to some extent. No, we're concerned with the idea of landscape and heritage as two concepts that, that come together into something bigger than, them, than themselves individually. And it'll be a very complicated relationship, it's a complex relationship, in which landscape and heritage together, and I've said here always and everywhere, it's this idea that it's not just special areas, it is everywhere, and it's not just for when you go on holiday, it's all your life. We, you all live in landscapes every single day of your life, you leave your house and you're in a public landscape or townscape immediately. Um, they all contain each other and they contribute to each other. And in doing so, it becomes a very, I, we, we want to argue, it's become a very dynamic and constructive way of seeing and acting and, re and responding to the big global challenges we heard about this morning, you know, demographic change, climate change responses, um, economic changes. It, it's, landscape particularly, but heritage too, is a good way to debate those big changes, particularly on the environmental sphere, because landscape in its origins includes people working together to share things. And if you're sharing things, you have to come to discussions and arrangements and so on. And it gives you a wider framework for deciding on things like the management of wetlands, for example, whether you manage them for, for um, wildlife benefits or manage them for social benefits, or both, hopefully. And we think that bringing them together as well will encourage a broader ownership of things. Because, as I say, if those people who don't think hedge is important probably think landscape is important and vice versa. Most people have a, a foot in one of those two camps. Some people have it in both. And, of course, not everyone uses either of those two words. I mean, one thing we've found so far in our conferences is that, as we always knew, it's, it's, not, it's not a new fact, but um, real people, ordinary people, the general public, don't go around using the word heritage every day of their lives. They don't wander off and talk about landscape in the, in the local bar. But they use words that mean the same things. It may be countryside, as in England. maybe may paysage, as in France. It could be all sorts of things. It may just be the word place. It may just be where I live, or where I went on holiday last year, it was a fantastic place, blah, blah, blah. It could be all sorts of reasons, but they, they're talking about the same thing, but using different vocabularies. And so the more we can broaden out our vocabulary, the more welcoming we are to others. And the bottom one, I think, is perhaps the most important in a way. One thing you learn the more you look at landscape and landscape's um, complexity, if you like, and the relationships within landscape, you realise that landscape is about change, it's dynamic. You cannot stop a landscape changing. Change is its character. Its very nature is that it's changed for thousands of years, and we've been around for 10,000 changing it even further, 500 changing it massively, 100 changing it even more massively. And without change, landscape sort of stops and dies and becomes something different, becomes the environment. It loses the human dimension, it loses the dynamic thing. And I think you can take from that lessons for heritage as well, and that we've perhaps got too used to thinking that heritage is something where you can stop the clock and preserve fabric. We heard this morning that you can't, that timber changes even when you preserved it, that, that rising down from buildings constantly breathing and living. The, the, even, even the most material physical aspect of heritage is actually still living and, and changing all the time. The scales might vary, but there's always change. So heritage and landscape aren't actually about protection or preservation. They're about managing change. They're about living with change, finding the best resolution at any particular day or moment to go on to the next one. They're really about moving from the past to the future. And, and those those trajectories. Okay, Chairscape, we hope, drops into all those concerns and, and, and lots of others too. As I say, I, I could talk for hours. Um, cultural heritage in landscape, it, the in could easily be an and or as or with, but the acronym worked better with the word in, so don't get too hung up on the word in. We have seven partners in five countries. I'll explain who they are later. Uh, we started... Well, theoretically in January 2014, but we had our first kickoff meeting in November because we were so eager to get started. And we're going to run for three years to the end of 2016. And we're aiming to explore the, some of the relationships I've just discussed between landscape and heritage. But most of all, we're aiming to try to explore how, when used together, on top of each other, side by side, within each other, whatever metaphor you want, possibly just as mirrors reflecting each other, perhaps, because you, know, you, you learn a lot from looking in the mirror. Uh, you learn a lot about change. Um, how they can be used to try to develop more constructive uses of heritage and therefore better use of heritage and of landscape. And beyond that, I think more importantly, 
because a lot of heritage discourse is about how we protect heritage. It's a little bit circular. Let's discuss heritage in order to protect it. Well, we all know now from all sorts of examples that heritage has wider benefits. It actually has social benefit. It, it, it can address socioeconomic issues. It can create better qualities of place, which increase uh, public happiness, public well-being, if you like. So can landscape. And I think that landscape and heritage together are actually up there with, in the, with the top half dozen, half dozen themes that might actually help Europe, if not the rest of the world, to address those big global challenges. It's a context within which to de debate what to do next, way beyond its own um, boundaries. The photographs, by the way, are so slightly random, picked, picked fairly randomly, just to illustrate it a bit, but they are, they're trying to show a little bit that our view of landscape is not just the conventional countryside, pretty, land, pretty rural view. It includes urban areas and, and lots of lots else beside. And I won't discuss them very much. And sometimes it's cold and bleak in the landscape just like it can be cold and bleak at some heritage sites. These were our aims, um, to strengthen the role of heritage in the, the issues I just talked about, the social and economic matters, the role of heritage beyond looking after itself, and beyond tourism for that matter. To demonstrate how landscape working as heritage, or working with heritage, can also do the same. And we have the help there of the European Landscape Convention, the ELC, which provided a framework for doing that. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, another aim is to try to reduce the fragmentation both within the heritage sector, within the landscape sector, which is much, much bigger than the heritage sector. There's innumerable, literally uncountable numbers of disciplines who see landscape as part of their remit, from, from psychology to economy, from archaeology to, to physics, I mean, almost sociology, almost any discipline can work at landscape level and can work through landscape, because landscape, far from just being a thing out there that you might look at, and far even from being a thing in people's heads and mental construct, it's also a way of seeing which anyone uses it and it's very useful to use. It's useful to think with, as somebody pointed out. And that fragmentation partly comes from something called the SPB, the Science Policy Briefing, produced five years ago, four years ago, by the European Science Foundation and the COST programme about landscape. It's called Landscape in a Changing World, Bridging Divides, something else, something else. And that one of its conclusions was that the landscape research sector was very powerful, very strong, but was fragmented and was only pulling half the weight it could, or a quarter, because it was working in its disciplinary silos and there's a need to bring them together. And we're hoping that being a heritage landscape together might also help with that. We, we're aiming to produce at the end the beginnings of a practical research agenda, which will feed into the JPI in future and into Heritage 2020 and other things. Um, responses to sets called heritage and at the bottom, as always, but we should be at the top, I suppose, making better connections between the public and policy making. And as we were just discussing about participation at our, at our first conference so far, we, we had lots of discussion about participation. We had big discussion sessions, each with their separate theme, broken down into endless subgroups. And as far as I could see, nearly every subgroup, all through the two days, constantly came back, whatever the theme was, came back to participation. We must get the public to participate. No one knew how, no one knew why even. It's something that had to be done. And we were told from some countries that it's difficult, as we heard earlier. We are told from some countries that it's difficult for different reasons, which is that the population haven't a culture of being consulted, that they find it odd that government can't just decide for them. So there's a, there's a whole range there, and participation is still there as an unresolved problem, I think. I don't think we've, we've, we've solved the issue at all. Um, very briefly on framework, I've mentioned the European Landscape Convention, this one. It gives a landscape framework. It's to do with landscape being a matter of perception. Um, uh, it's to do with individual and, and collective attitudes toward landscape. It's to do with what it calls landscape quality objectives, the aspirations of the public for where they want to live in future. As a, as a form of it's a form of particip participation. Again, it's a very bottom-up, people-centred view of landscape um, management. And the Faro Convention, with its associated book Heritage and Beyond, which sets out this this new direction that heritage might take, which is much more to do with people than it is with things and to do with why people want heritage and what it means to people, values, and all the range of social and economic values that grow from it. The JPI, obviously, is a framework, the strategic research agenda, and our project particularly hits the, the four, those four reflective society themes of identity and the perception, values, and ethics. Ethics is very strong in landscape because landscape is about how you treat your fellow citizen when you share in the same piece of land. Uh, but we also speak to the Connecting Peoples and Heritage Agenda, and we speak to the, the Safeguarding one as well. So we, we, this is a very strong framework for the JPI. And finally, the Science Pulse Briefing that I mentioned before, Landscape in a Changing World. So we have a, an outer shell, if you like, within which we can work, but we're not bound by it. We, we go beyond it, if need be. 
And I mentioned before that I think that heritage can, can sort of learn lessons from the landscape, and of course the opposite is true as well. Heritage can learn lessons from the landscape. I mean, which of those two pictures is heritage and which is landscape? It's, 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 a, it's a silly question. They're both both. Um, but among the lessons that one side or the other, and I'm not, not going to say which I think is the direction is, but from one side or the other, there are lessons that they are learning of the importance of change. That's the importance is the wrong word. The centrality of change, the relevance of change, the unavoidability, but also the need to embrace change, which landscape teaches to heritage to some extent, but also vice versa. The ubiquity of heritage and landscape, that it is everywhere. And for the last hundred years, we've been desperately making up our list to make it a manageable project by excluding more, by excluding things and just going down to the most important things. That's what I think the last 100 years has been about, not, not choosing the best, but simply trying to make it manageable by, by restricting the vast majority of hedges and saying it's not our concern. Social relevance, doesn't really need talking about, but then things like place, identity, memory, all of those are created within that framework of landscape and heritage. And I think probably heritage teaches landscape most for place, and landscape perhaps teaches heritage most for identity, but you can argue it both ways. Question of inheritance, I mean, it's implicit in the word heritage, but it's also, in, a, in effect, implicit in the word landscape, or in a, it's explicit in the word heritage and implicit in the word landscape. They're both inherited objects, inherited perceptions. They both, therefore, by definition, will be transmitted. If you handed something on, you can throw it away, but you're still transmitting it to a different future. You can't avoid your inheritance. It's there on your shoulder. So inheritance always carries with it the implication of what you do next. Even if you walk away from it, yes, that's a decision the transmission, the, the legacy. And they both, they both landscape and uh, heritage, but probably heritage is teaching landscape the, the lesson here. Um, they both depend on past human agency, present day human agency, future human activities, and they both depend on collective activity as well. Landscape particularly is a product of people working in groups. The very word landscape, the scape part, is the same word as the word ship, like fellowship. It's a container that holds people together in a piece of land or in an organization. Landscape is about people working together. Okay, our methods are really simple. We're simply, simply and only going to organise five interdisciplinary conferences in two and a half years. It's quite easy. Um, and these conferences are not reporting conferences. You know, they're, they're all the way through our project. We're not waiting to the end to have a com conference to say this is what we've found. The conferences is our research methods, how we drawing, how we contact people and getting, met and getting information. And their aim is to promote debate among researchers and practitioners at the conference and to collect their opinions. We did keep the conference format because we felt we wanted a certain amount of input from people who've thought about this for a long time. But we made sure that the presentations don't take up more than about half the time at the conference. And the other half is taken up by big discussion sessions using different methods, fishbowl methods, um, walking around chatting in small groups methods, poster discussion methods. We've, we've got a variety of methods at each one, which allows people to debate what they've heard at the presentations and bring in their own ideas. And by and large, we don't stand up, our partners don't, don't stand up and speak themselves at the conferences. We're, we're there as listeners, not as talkers. I think some of us have got tired of going to conferences and being told what to think, so we're letting other people come and tell us what to think. Um, and you can see there the sort of formats we use. I mean, some of them are sitting in rows looking at the screen, but others are much more mobile and the presentations go on web on the line afterwards and we will at some point invite people to comment on those as well here are our partners uh, seven partners in five countries it's a mixture there's there's some university universities in, in there there's some national agencies like the um, the Dutch cutted Hedge agency and the two Norwegian partners are the are NICU the Norwegian Institute for Cultural Heritage, and Bioforce, the Institute for Agriculture and Environmental Research, which also has a landscape and a heritage element within it. So the universities, there are government agencies, and there's um, a research institution in, in, Mad in Madrid, a CISC as well, which is not quite one or the other of those two things. So we have a range of people, and everybody in those in the project, all the partners have their networks because everyone has worked in European projects before on this subject or something very close to it. So they're bringing in their, their networks as well. So our, and that's the body of the consortium, that's the consortium, uh, seven organisations and about 15 or 16 people. But beyond that, there's a, a hinterland of people that we all know and, and involved at various levels. And through the five conferences, we're going to gather 
more, obviously. Another reason for keeping to the conference format, as well as having so what you might call expert views to, to, to kick-start our debates, the other reason was to keep the numbers higher. Because if you go down, if you work, go for small discussion groups, you have, that's 30 people. We're aiming for something like 75 or 90 people at our conferences, including ourselves and including the speakers, so that by the end of our five conferences, we, we, we will perhaps have interacted, discussed with, well, I don't know, depends how many people come more than once, but 300 people, 350, 400 people perhaps. So that will be, in one definition, that then becomes the Chairscape Consortium. Those are all the people who've been involved and all their ideas. And from that, we're going to be creating wider networks for future work. And in fact, we've, we've made, we've got two stage, two stage two applications for Hedges Plus in from different members in our consortium going off, finding other partners and producing what you might call um, Chairscape successor projects, following through some of the ideas that we can already see emerging. So we're waiting to see for April or January if those are successful. Um, our products and outputs, some of them are going to be intangible, and I, I have a feeling those might be the most influential ones, the ones that you can't actually touch. And we all have to write down in our applications what are the concrete outcomes, the concrete products. But sometimes, and we do that obviously, and there are going to be some, I'll show you in a moment, but I think sometimes the more important ones are the fact that you've actually touched someone's brain, <laughs> or the emotions perhaps, and you've made them think slightly differently, and you can never catch that, you never, never sort of quantify it for a grant application. But we are having, as our intangible outcomes, the sharing and promotion of ideas, not just from us to our audiences, but within the audiences, and when they go back to their universities, to their colleagues. We're going to be creating existing networks which won't always be visible, but they'll be there. People meet in our conferences, go away and start doing research together, have a larger network at the end of it. We're going to be encouraging debate, and some of it, sometimes we're deliberately provocative to encourage debate, and that's also another outcome of Cherry Escapes. But then, then, there again, some of our projects are going to be tangible and, and concrete. We have a web page which will lead to profile raising. We're going to put the presentations, and we've already started doing it for our first conference, presentations and the posters that we have onto our web page so they can be looked at longer. Our posters, incidentally, are actually an integral part of the conference structure. They're not sort of put into a back room. They're, they're spread throughout the conference premises and, and the large amount of time, two or three hours, set aside to break it down into groups and go and discuss them in debates. That, that feeds in more than just the posters. Um, we're going to produce briefing notes from each conference. Those are, those are the very first interim ones, not quite finished. There should be three from each conference, one summarising the conclusions, one which is here, by, here labelled a policy briefing, one labelled a science briefing, and each conference will produce these leaflets which will cumulative, cumulatively lead to a bigger, a bigger set of recommendations at the end on, on those topics. We'll have an end of conference, end of project, sorry, synthetic academic proceedings, There'll be, there'll be research agenda suggestions of various sorts, and there'll be some peer-reviewed papers and, and things of that sort. <coughs> We've also already started giving presentations at other people's conferences, like, like these projects do. We've given talks at PESCARL, the permanent, permanent European Standing Committee for the Rural Landscapes. It's been going since 1958 or something. Very long-running conference, originally historical geographers, but now interdisciplinary. We've given them a presentation a few months ago. Um, a large conference on landscaping at the Brussels Free University back in March. We've organised a session at the Rome Landscape Archaeology Conference, which was cherry-scape flavoured, cherry flavoured. And we have a big session at the closing conference of a cost action called in Investigating the Place of Culture and Sustainability next, next May in Helsinki, which is something I'm involved in as well, the, the cost action. I mean, it's a project looking at culture and sustainability, if culture is the fourth pillar, or whether culture is the overarching framework for sustainability. And we've got a, pro we've got a session from Chairscape within that to start the debate with sociologists and social, um, uh, uh, sociologists. And we've got various of the conferences going on over, f over five years. Each has a theme. They're all about landscape and heritage, but one is policy, the one we've had. One will look at science and research, that's next week. One will be looking at landscape as community, and this is getting close to people-centred people, people -centered and perceptions. Then there's one looking at global change, particularly environmental, but how landscape can help heritage meet these global challenges. And the final one, excuse me, the final one, which will be in Newcastle, is going to be on unimagined, unimagined and virtual future landscapes and future heritage, and the digital, digital heritage as well as other things. So we have our three years mapped out. Our first conference took place in Ghent a few weeks ago, well, three months ago in July. Uh, I, think, I think about 80 or 90 people 
despite the Brussels railway system collapsing that day. Some people, some people couldn't come. Uh, and I've talked enough about that, probably. And our second conference is next week, so if it's not too late, you're all very welcome, any of you are very welcome to come and, come and join us in Amersfoort, the headquarters of the, um, the Dutch Critical Heritage Agency. Fifth, it's not the 5th, 6th, it's the 5th, 6th, 7th. It's a three-day conference. It's, it's nearly all week, anyway. So come along. Amersfoort's a, a, a wonderful, lovely, lovely little town, well worth a visit. And if it is too late, there are three more that you can come to if you want to. Our third one on community is in Oslo in May. Our fourth one on environmental and global change will be in Madrid, or somewhere close to Madrid. And the fifth one, as I said, will be in Newcastle. So you're all very welcome. You can find details on the web, which will be updated as we go along. So thank you.